We are going to be without a pianist today, but we'll still go ahead and go through a couple of songs. We're going to be singing all of our songs on um, verses 1 and 4, so we're going to skip 2 and 3, just 1 and 4. So please stand with me as we sing on page 335, Standing on the Promises. Standing on the promises of God's mighty, through eternal ages let His praises ring. For we in the highest time will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Our sin debt paid in full. 
We're also united with Him. At salvation, we become God's adopted children. Isn't that good news this morning? And then last, citizens of heaven. We receive citizenship in God's kingdom and an inheritance that will never perish according to 1 Peter 1, 4. Many of us don't realize we're rich because we think in terms of bank accounts and material possessions, but these things have no eternal value. Our real wealth is found in the spiritual blessing we've been given through Christ. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we can come together this morning to worship and serve you. And Lord, Satan's tried to knock us down in several different ways this week. But Lord, we're still here and we're singing because Jesus is our story. This is the story that we want to share all the day long. And we just thank you for that. We thank you for each one here. We pray for those that are away sick and um, all the others, many prayer requests. And that we'll share in a moment, Lord. We just love you and praise you. In Jesus' sweet and precious and holy name we pray. Amen. You can remain seated as our next song is on page 330, Amazing Grace. We'll see in verses 1 and 5. Verse 1. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saves.
So pray for whoever broke in our church. There, there's nothing to steal. They didn't get anything. The alarm scared them off. There's nothing in here but a couple of old computers, probably worth 20 bucks, and that sound system is probably 20 years old. It ain't worth much, especially resale value. But anyway, we're here this morning singing a cappella, and we're going to have church and praise the Lord and, and hope to keep this thing going on. What was so strange at, at the hospital, um, the first, God took care of all of this. Um, God told Levi that we got to do something yesterday. We went to urgent care Tuesday, Thursday. Um, if we hadn't went to the hospital, they wouldn't have found this problem through a CAT scan. And it, 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 he may have had a stomach virus so that we could find this problem. I don't know. Um, hopefully we'll get better news today. He's waiting on a vascular surgeon to come talk to him this morning. Um, but anyway, it's so funny how, not funny, but it's so great how God works. We took him to the hospital when, when people were saying, like, urgent care, just wait another day or two and see if it goes away. But it had been from Monday to Saturday. So we go to the hospital, and it wasn't that busy. I was shocked. And um, the, the first nurse that we had was a male nurse named Doug that sings in the choir at New Hope Baptist Church. And he said that he had been a paramedic for 42 years and, and now had been a nurse at Newton Hospital for one year. And he said, this is the least busiest I've seen this emergency room in a whole year. The next nurse came on and said the same thing. She said, I've been off for two weeks. And come back and I was shocked. They, they just weren't busy. And, and then the doctor that he got comes in and says, I'm the supervising doctor for the emergency room. So I'm like, what? Well, he gets the best doctor, the best nurses, everything. So thank you for praying. Um, at this time, we're going to have an offertory prayer. And... Um, I'm going to ask Josiah, will you, I, I put too much on him. He's already saying, can you say the prayer that I've got over? All right, guys. Lord, we come to you um, asking for prayer about many things, about my brother, about our church, that we can keep going, about our nation, that we can stand strong together, pray for our operatory, that we realize that you give us everything and that we can offer something back up to you, Lord, and just don't pray. Amen. If you will, stand with me on page 141, we will sing the first and last verse of All the Legged Cross. Verse 1.
Um, they named off Patty's phone number, and I changed it to my phone number because I wasn't the one there with them. And so the doctor may call me or something. Yeah, as you can imagine, Mom and Dad's a little worried. Levi seems to be okay. He, he, he seems to be okay. And I, I know God's going to work this, work us through this. Um, let me go ahead and do some prayer requests and things. Um, let me think of what else I was going to say. Oh, about the, the break-in. Um, so far, we're up to about six or seven hundred dollars on the repairs for the window and the alarm system in our. Insurance is $2,500 deductible, so the church is going to pay for it. And you've got to come back and fix the siren for the alarm that they tore out of the ceiling. But um, we got to save as much as we can by having a high deductible. Um, lots to pray about. Some good news, too. Um, let me think. Hopefully, I won't miss some of these. Shelby Toucher finally tested negative. Um, she tested me, te texted me a couple of days ago. She had tested positive three or four or five times and, and it's having to be quarantined even though she's not sick anymore. And so she was so thrilled she finally tested um, negative for COVID. Um, Patsy Williford and Sonny both tested negative yesterday. Um, Patsy had tested positive a week or so ago and her son, even though both of them not had very many symptoms. And, and Patsy said it's just amazing that she can live in the same household with Sonny and him not have it. But he's been through enough. He's been, in the, you know, he's been through too much lately. So that again, that's God's grace. Um, Jean Wallace called me Monday morning, and last Sunday she asked us to pray for Arthur's sister, um, Joanne. And Joanne called her Monday morning, so I'm all better. I'm so much better. And, and jo Jean told her, "Well, our church prayed for you." Um, Curtis Gosden. Um, Curtis Gosden is in her mid to upper 90s and she's in the hospital with COVID and that's not good. Um, she's a lot better. Oh, is she better? They, to, they turned down the oxygen. Great. So she was doing uh, better. She was bossing them around. That is amazing. <laughs> because two or three days ago, Jean told me that her oxygen was at 70% and they told him if it got much worse they can put her on an event. And um, I don't mean to gossip, most of y'all probably know this, but it, it, Curtis even smoked. And with that age, I was worried sick. Now she's been in country gardens for a few months. I don't know if they let her smoke there or not, but she did up until a few months ago. Um, but so pray for Curtis. Um, Pat Turner's at home not feeling well. Marvin's here, but Pat's not feeling well. Um, who else do we need? Benny. Benny got a diploma this week. Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. He, um, he got his last 25th radiation treatment Thursday and got a diploma. So I told Becky to tell him now that he has a diploma, I have a job for him. He needs to be on our security detail again because they, they do a lot of walking up this way and checking on the church. I doubt you're up here at 5 o'clock in the morning. The alarm went off at 4.50 a.m. We came by yesterday, Chad. We yeah. were in the truck. Though, I put alarm stickers in every window on the church and, and some signs out front. I've got a couple more that I'm going to put out. So hopefully that'll scare them off. But um, who else do we need to pray for? I got eye surgery this coming up week. Okay. Same to change. And his appointment to see the uh, orthopedic is the 27th. You don't have an MRI right before he sees him. Okay. 27th. All right. Um, Marvin, will yours be outpatient? Yeah. Okay. Buddy? Katie, I've come down there and uh, maybe they're taking him off the ventilator. He's getting well. Too. Wow. Kay's cousin, Wayne Watson, has been on a ventilator in Macon. I heard a couple days ago he was down to 20% or something. And so he said they're going to take them off the ventilator. So we need to really pray, pray, pray for these folks. Um, pray for Levi. I appreciate you praying for Levi. I, I was able to share with him last night that several churches are praying for him and people from different states and, and so forth. Debbie? Oh, Hope, yesterday we prayed. Well, you didn't have to go pick up uh, Josiah, but <laughs> when you left our prayer yesterday. Yes. And uh, Hope had fractured her tailbone. Oh, it was no. a terrible pain, you know. That's very painful. But, um, but she went to work. They wanted her to try to work, you know. And she was just going to be standing up, you know. So she um, 
she didn't feel like going, but she went ahead and went, and she said, I had no more pain. Just oh, wow. we prayed for her, you know. See, I prayed for her yesterday on the Sunday. Yeah, uh, and that's she, said, she said, she said, y'all pray, you know. <laughs> I'm telling you. So. I'm telling you. God answers prayers, amen? Amen. <laughs> All right, well, let's move on. Um, here's a little email funny. A local priest and a pastor stood by the side of the road holding up a sign that said, The end is near. Turn yourself around now before it's too late. They planned to hold up the sign for to each passing car. And people rode by and hollered, Leave us alone, you religious nuts, yelled the first driver as he said, fed by. From around the curve, they heard a big splash. And one of the pastors said, do you think we should put just put up a sign that says bridge out instead? <laughs> Two men were on trial in Superior Court for armed robbery. An eyewitness took the stand, and the prosecutor got up and began his questioning. And first he asked our witness, were you at the scene of the crime, of the robbery? And they said, yes. And he said, you saw a vehicle leave at a high rate of speed? And they said, yes. Did you observe the occupants? Yes. And the prosecutor in a booming prosecutor's voice said, and are those two men in the courtroom today? And at this point, the defendants sealed their fate. They both raised their hands. Dumb criminal. Now let's admit it, we're going to be talking about guilt today. The truth is, all of us at some point in our lives have to honestly say, I did it. There are things that we've all struggled with. We're all in the same boat. James 2.10 says, The person who keeps every law of God but makes one little slip is just as guilty as the person who has broken every law there is. Think about what that verse is saying. Those that are of the legalistic crowd that want to try to measure up on their own and try to live perfect lives, they're just as guilty as, as any of the rest of us if they've committed this one fault. Obviously, when it comes to the way we evaluate guilt, there are different degrees of guilt. Some people commit crime and they deserve what happens to them. It's justice. About God's kind of justice. Recognizing the fact that whether it's one sin or many in our lives, we've all slipped, we've all sinned, and we're all in the same boat. So we're going to talk this morning about what is it that real guilt is. What is real guilt? What's the difference between real guilt and another kind of guilt that we're going to talk about this morning, a false kind of guilt? We're going to talk about how our, our ways of dealing with guilt usually don't work. They differ greatly from God's way of dealing with guilt. God has a wonderful way of dealing with guilt, and it's called grace. So number one, what is guilt? What is guilt? We all know what it feels like to feel guilty. Psalm 38, 4, David said, My guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden too heavy to bear. Every one of us knows that overwhelmed, burdened feeling, that feeling of I hope nobody finds out. But is that all there is to guilt? Is that what God means for it to be? Is it some kind of punishment that He sends into my life, your life, when we've done something wrong? He says, okay, you did something wrong, live with this for a little while. Does He mean for us to do that for a while or for the rest of our lives? No. The purpose of guilt is not just to make you feel bad. Guilt is actually kind of like a warning light. Uh, picture it that way. It's a warning light that goes off that says something's wrong. Something needs to be fixed. And I got news for you. We can't fix it. <laughs> Only God can fix it. Uh, it. It's like the warning light that goes off on the dashboard of your car which says something's wrong. Uh, Patty and I have this conversation sometimes that goes on in the car. We're, we're driving down the road and she'll say, what was that? I, I heard a sound in the engine. It sounds like something's wrong. And I said, well, I, I didn't hear anything. I'll just keep on driving. Well, she's got a pretty good ear, so she's usually hearing that something is wrong. But I know if something's wrong, I'm going to have to fix it. So I don't hear anything. For, for most men, 
the engine has to actually just fall out before we think that something's actually wrong. That's the way we deal with guilt sometimes. Many times. We try to ignore it or pretend that it's not there. We've got lots of different ways of dealing with this warning light that God sends into our life. But the truth is, if something really is wrong, the best thing to do is to get it fixed. I could try to fix the car myself, but I'm not very good at that. So what do I need to do? I need to take it back to the manufacturer. And that's what we need to do with our lives. That's what the warning light is saying. It's saying you need some time with God. You need God to heal this. That's the warning light that God's showing us. So, But before we look at the difference of how we try to deal with that warning light and how God's able to really deal with it, how we try to fix ourselves and it doesn't work, and how He's able to fix us, We've got to make a very important distinction this morning. There's an important distinction to discover about guilt. There's two different kinds of guilt. There is genuine guilt, the real deal. We've all dealt with that, the genuine guilt that comes from the fact that we've done wrong things, that we've hurt ourselves, we've hurt others, we've hurt the heart of God. And that's the honest truth. Unless you're perfect, and none of us are, we've all had to deal with this feeling of genuine guilt. But there's another brand of guilt that is very important to understand if you're going to get past this and find God's grace in the midst of it, and that is false guilt. That's thinking that there might be a light on the dashboard, and that comes on, and, and, and you're so worried about it that you worry yourself into guilt. That's feeling like if a light on the dashboard ever came on, what would people think of me? Uh, there's many people who deal with this false guilt. I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say something like this. I just have this overwhelming feeling of guilt. I, I don't know where it comes from. I, I can't really put my thumb on it. I, I don't know the source of it, but I just feel bad. And Satan wants you to go through life feeling that way. If you're dealing with false guilt, you're probably sending yourself a lot of false messages. And they're kind of like this. You think that's enough? Or, or you call that acceptable? Look at all the things you haven't gotten finished. You have disappointed the people around you. That's the kind of things you start hearing a lot if you're dealing with false guilt. And I don't have to tell you where that's coming from. It's coming from the enemy. And we need to understand that often false guilt in our lives, if we struggle uh, uh, if we struggle a lot with this, is the result of incidences that may have not even been your fault to begin with. Some of the people who struggle the most with false guilt struggle because they were caught up in the circle of someone else's sin. At some point in their lives, it may be a parent, a friend, it could be some kind of abuse, physical abuse, mental abuse, or emotional abuse. But somehow, maybe even at an early age, you were caught up in the cycle of someone else's sin, and you feel that you just can't get that out of your life. There's also times that false guilt is there because you just can't get past your past. This is what we hear people say when they're feeling this way. I've asked God a thousand times to forgive me, and I just don't feel forgiven. That's when you can't get past your past. Probably all of us have dealt in some ways with false guilt. What we need to understand today is that false guilt is very popular among churchgoers. It's a great thing in the church. It produces a faith that's more walls than it is doors. There's no way out. It closes in on you. It's been a problem for those who've been trying to find the truth of God for a long, long time. But in Galatians, Paul talks to, to some people who are struggling with false guilt, trying to make themselves feel better by doing a lot of things, trying to jump through hoops, trying to measure up. In Galatians 3.3, 3, Paul says, You began your life in Christ by the Spirit. That's now you're trying to make it complete by your own power. That is foolish. But that's the sign of what happens when we struggle with false guilt. We can't feel forgiven by God, so we try more and more to make it better by our own power, and it just doesn't work. 
Last week I told you if you want to understand, truly understand grace, go home and read the book of Romans. Well, Romans has got a lot of chapters in it. This week I'm going to tell you to look at some of Paul's short epistles. Philippians, Ephesians, Galatians, Colossians. Those are all like four or five chapters. Read those and you'll start to understand more and more about grace. One of the best things we can do as we talk about guilt is talk about how do you know the difference? How do you know the difference between true guilt and false guilt? How do you know if it's God who's speaking to you or your Jewish grandmother or Sister Margaret from parochial, parochial school, I don't even know if I'm saying that right, or here's a good one, how do you know if it's God or if it's Brother Bob from some fundamentalist church? How do you know who it is who's really speaking to you? Three tests. Jot these down if you're taking notes. Three tests that will help you determine, discern whether this is true guilt or false guilt. Number one is to focus on people or is it on God? Is the focus on people or is it on God? Dr. Paul Turner says false guilt, false guilt is that which comes as the results of judgments and the suggestions of men. True guilt is that which comes as a result of divine judgment, what God thinks about the situation. So what are you worried about more? What some pastor or some church or some religion thinks or what God thinks? If you're struggling, you're going to find yourself striving for a lot of approval. You'll be an approval junkie. You need other people's approval to make you feel better about yourself. It's a daily fix that you need, and you need more and more to help you feel better about yourself. Uh, the problem with this is when you're struggling with false guilt is you live a lot of life worn out. It'll wear you out. Why? We have a hard enough time just trying to live up to our own expectations. If you have to live up to everybody else's expectations to get their approval, that wears you out. So is it people or is it God? Number two, is it vague or is it specific? Is it vague or is it specific? Sometimes people will say something like this. It's this cloud of doubt, a fog of guiltiness, and they don't know how to get rid of it. If you ask them what it leads back to, what's the struggle they're facing, and, and they really can't say, almost all of the time when it's vague, a foggy feeling of guilt, it's Satan talking to you and not God. God, when he wants to tell us that we've done something wrong and help us to get it right, the Holy Spirit, he does it like a pinpoint of light, not this vague, cloudy thing. When God speaks to us about something, he's able to do it like a pinpoint of light. He just does it everywhere we are. We hear a sermon and it's on that subject. We turn on the radio, somebody's singing a song on that subject. We watch a television show and it's on that subject. Everything's about that. God does that. So let me ask you again, is it this vague feeling of guilt that you really don't know where it's coming from? Or is it the Holy Spirit? Is it God's pinpoint of light saying, here's what is wrong, here's what you're doing wrong, and here's how to get it fixed? How do you handle it 
It's amazing how we have common ways of handling these feelings of guilt. They go all the way back to the first man and the first woman in, in the, garden, the, the very first sin in the Garden of Eden. The ways that they dealt with that first sin is pretty common with us today. We can all relate with it. Genesis 3, the Bible tells us that they first sewed fig leaves, fig leaves together and made something to cover themselves. Then they hid from the Lord God. And then when challenged, Adam said, I was afraid because I was naked. She gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. So here's three ways that are indicated in the way that they responded and the way that we still respond even today. Three things. Number one, we often respond with shame. We often respond with shame. We feel bad about it. And then guilt just weighs us down. Let me tell you something. If you think that you can feel bad enough about the wrong things that you've done to make them okay or to make them go away, probably most of you have already discovered that that doesn't work. Shame doesn't work. Number two, hiding. Hiding. They sewed fig leaves together and tried to hide out. They hid in the bushes from God as if God couldn't see them there. Uh, that's like trying to put your hand over the light on the dashboard that's going off and just pretend that nothing's really wrong. It doesn't work. But they tried that one. They hid out. Number three, blame. Blame. Good gracious, is this not a uh, popular one in this day and age? Blame your parents. Blame the way you was raised. Blame anybody except for taking responsibility for yourself. But blame, this is a popular one. It's sort of a tragic, humorous story that happens in Genesis. You've got Adam and Eve and the serpent, and God comes, and God asks Adam, did you eat of that fruit of that tree? Well, Adam took it like a man, and he blamed his wife. He points right at Eve and says, she did it. It's her fault. She gave me the fruit. So Eve's standing there, blamed too. She points at the serpent and says, the serpent did it. Of course, the serpent didn't have a leg to stand on. It isn't easy to try to blame your way out of the wrong things that have happened, but we all do this. But sooner or later, we realize it doesn't work anymore. All the blame, all the shame, all the ways we've got of trying to deal with this guilt, it doesn't work. So what do you do when that happens? What do you do? I, I, the most miserable Christian, I believe, in the, the, in the world today is the Christian that's trying to live a perfect life, trying to measure up. Of course we want to live a righteous life because we love God and we want to live right and be a shining light for Him, a great witness for Him. But when you're just trying to live by a bunch of rules and trying to satisfy man, it's a miserable type of existence. But God has a way of dealing with guilt too. And it's very different from our way. So number three, God's way of handling guilt. One word, the word grace. Grace. When we first become a Christian, one of the first verses in the Bible that we should learn about how to live this new life that God has given to us is 1 John 1, 9. Listen to this. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just, and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. I want to challenge you this morning to memorize that verse. Memorize that verse this week. That's how we deal with the guilt that makes us sick and splits us up and tears us apart. We do it God's way. So three things to, to identify God's way. Number one, confess your sins. Number one, confess your sins. You say, God, I did it. I confess my sin. Uh, not just our needs, our sin. Not just our frustration, our sin. Not just our problems, our sin. Now what does that word mean, sin? There's a lot of fancy definitions out there, but the easiest way to understand it for me is to look at the middle letter in that word. Sin is all about the I. It's all about my way. It's all about me saying God to God, excuse me, but I'm going to live life my own way. I've got my own plans. It's about me looking at the car and saying, it looks okay to me, so I'm leaving God out. 
That's what it's all about. Whether you look very moral in this world's eyes or very immoral, you can still have that eye right in the middle of your life. Leaving God out. That's what sin is all about. When it comes to sin, we do one of two things. We cover up or we face up. We, we try to cover up and pretend it's not there or we face up to it. When you face up to it, the number one thing we need to do is to tell God that we're facing up to it. That, that's what confessing is. How, how do you confess your sin? You tell God. You might as well tell God. He already knows. He already knows everything, so why not tell Him, God, I'm acknowledging that I've done this. Why not be honest about it? Look at Psalm 69.5. God, God, you know what I have done wrong. I cannot hide my guilt from you. There's nothing more difficult than trying to hide something that cannot be hidden. There's nothing more wearying, nothing more costly. Why try to hide it from God? Just be honest with it. Telling God, confessing to God means more than just admitting. The literal meaning of this word is saying the same thing about it. In other words, you say to God, I agree with you about this. I agree that this is wrong. No, don't listen to the world because in the world nothing's wrong anymore. It's just according to what you think is right. But how do you confess? How do you tell God? You do it through prayer. The second part of 1 John 1 9 reminds us to really experience God's grace. We not only have to confess our sins, but we need to, number two, trust God's character. Number two, trust God's character. Many people confess their sins but really never get to know the God who is forgiving them. And because of that, they never feel the forgiveness that He wants to give. First John 1 John 1.9 says He is faithful and just. You can count on God. You can count on His faithfulness. A lot of people think that they can't get close to God because they just don't feel forgiven. In a way, that's a trap because the truth is the closer you get to God, the more that you'll feel forgiven. You'll start realizing, wow, I am forgiven. I am worthy in the sight of God. Not because of anything I've done, but because I've been given the righteousness of Christ. When you and I get close to God who loves us, who gave His life for us in Christ, when we get close to Him, we really sense what His forgiveness is all about. So as long as you hold God at arm's length, you're not going to feel His forgiveness. Look at His invitation in Hebrews 10, 22. He says, Let us come near to God with a sincere heart and a sure faith because we have been made free from a guilty conscience. There's a lot of people that need to understand this that needs to be set free from a guilty conscience. That's what the cross is all about. That's what Him giving His life for us is all about. Once we've accepted that gift, the, in, the invitation is get close to me. When you get close to God and understand His grace in a new way, it frees you to become the person that He wants you to be. It doesn't happen through guilt. Listen to this. You will never become the person that God wants you to be through guilt. You become the person God wants you to be through His grace when you understand His grace. And it's nothing that you've done. It's all about what Jesus did. When we think we did it, that's when we become proud. And we, we can live an almost perfect life and, and hardly never sin. And we can live real good about ourselves. And here's that word, that I, that letter I in the middle of the word sin because we're boasting on ourselves. The Bible says, save through grace so that no one can boast. Number three, accept God's forgiveness. Accept God's forgiveness. You better circle that word accept. If we confess our sins, He's faithful. He can be trusted to forgive us of our sins. And the verse ends by saying, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Think about what that's saying. He will purify us from all unrighteousness. Not, not that He'll purify purifies from most unrighteousness or a lot of unrighteousness but he will purify us from all what an important three letter word about grace what God is able to do 
And yet a lot of people who ask for forgiveness recognize that Jesus is willing to forgive, and yet they only feel cleansed from part of their sins rather than all. Look at God's promise. You just accept God's forgiveness. Look at Isaiah, I mean, John, I'm sorry, John 3 8. John 3 8 says, People who believe in God's Son are not judged guilty. People who believe in God's Son are not judged guilty. When we believe in Christ and trust in what He did for us on the cross, the Bible says you're not judged guilty. If you've already trusted in Christ and believed in what He's done, why are you continuing to judge yourself guilty when God's already said, I judge you not guilty? He's the judge, not us. If you've never trusted in Christ, what Christ has done for you, His willingness to forgive you, then God's saying, I'm willing, I'm willing to say not guilty to you. So why not take advantage of that and trust in Christ as your Savior? We all have this picture that we're going to go to, go to heaven one day and at the pearly gates, that's where we're going to be judged guilty or not guilty. But that's not where it happens. It's determined here on earth, not in heaven. Right here and now, you can settle the issue. God is Christ to say, I will judge you not guilty. Why? Because you deserve it? No, of course not, but because of God's grace. Does that mean that you'll never fail again? Never make a mistake again? Of course not, but it does mean when you do, when you do fall and make mistakes and sin, that you confess your sin again and you recognize His willingness to forgive and you take the consequences of that sin and recognize that His grace can even help you with the consequences. Uh, this thing of accepting God's forgiveness is somewhat like a, getting a medical bill. Think about this. What if you get a medical bill in the mail? Maybe you've had a big bill at the hospital. I don't even want to talk about this this morning. But all of a sudden, the words paid in full appear on that bill. If it says paid in full, are you going to worry about it any longer? Only if you feel like I didn't really pay it. If you, if you feel like somebody's, some computer somewhere made a mistake and somebody one day they're going to catch up to you. A lot of people feel that way about their sins. They, they, they feel like I know the Bible says this thing about paid in full, but someday God's going to catch up to you. But what if, along with that hospital bill, that invoice, a letter inside, that invoice that's paid in full, there's a letter inside from the director of the hospital that said, we're deciding to pay this bill in full for you, and if there's ever any problem with the accounting department, take this letter with my personal signature on it, my name on it, and, and take it in and show it to them, and that will make sure that they know that this bill is paid in full. Would that make a difference? Would that give you more confidence? Well, God's given us a letter called the Bible. And the Bible was written to clearly say that He wants you to know that the sin debt in our lives is paid in full. Paid in full. So the next time Satan from the accounting department calls, show him the letter. Show him the letter right here. It was signed in the blood of Jesus Christ. Some of you may still be struggling with this. It's a big struggle to recognize how God, how big God's grace is, how huge it is, how great it is. And you're thinking, well, you don't know how big my sin is. You don't know what I did. It may have been years ago and no one knows about it. You don't know how I hurt my kids, how I hurt my wife, how I hurt my parents. You have no idea how could God forgive me. When you look in this book, the Bible, God's letter to us, you start to read story after story that says, yes, God can not only forgive us, but He can even use us. You read the story about a guy named Abraham in the Old Testament. He starts out worshiping idols. He had a lot of struggles with lying. But we, yet we call him the father of our faith. You read a story about Moses, who at the start of his life was a murderer. And yet today we call him the one who set the children free to go to the promised land. You read the story about a guy named Paul in the New Testament. He started out being named Saul. And he went to churches and persecuted people. 
He actually stood by while Christians were murdered. And yet, you and I call him an apostle and a writer of the New Testament. Over half of the New Testament. Uh, God not only wants to free you of your guilt, he wants to use you in a new way. And that's the good news about grace. I realize that this has not been easy for some of you to hear. For some of you, guilt has kind of become sort of a strange best friend in your life. Sort of like a teddy bear with fangs. You cuddle it, but in the end it will get you. And you get real used to your guilt sometimes. It motivates you in the morning. You get up and have a little guilt for breakfast to get you going. Have a little right before you go to bed. You're, you're really wondering, if I step out into the fresh air of God's grace, I don't think I can stay motivated. I'd, I'd plummet if I did that. As if your guilt could hold you up better than God's grace. It doesn't make sense, but it's how we feel sometimes. It's scary to step out into God's grace. For others, guilt has become the enemy that you've been running from all your life. You're pretending that it's not there. Something that happened. You've got a lot of different tricks, a lot of different ways, uh, like all of us do, for hiding from it, just like Adam and Eve tried to do. Whatever the case, here's a verse with you. We're going to close with Psalm 32.5. I want you to think about this this morning. Psalm 32.5 says, I finally admitted all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide them. I said to myself, I will confess them to the Lord, and you forgave me. And all my guilt is gone. Isn't that incredible? Some of you need the first half of that verse. I finally admitted all my sins to God and stopped trying to hide them. You need to say, God, I admit it. I need your forgiveness. I'm tired of trying all my ways of making up for it. Others of us need the second half of that verse that says, and you forgave me and all my guilt is gone. Can you imagine how freeing that was when David understood that? The sad thing is that for some people it takes them 10, 15, 25 years to get from the first half of that verse to the second half of that verse. Don't let it be that way with you. Recognize that he's the God of grace who wants to forgive and shower grace among, on us and shower grace upon us more than we could ever comprehend no matter who we are or what we've done. Why? Because we deserve it. No. Because He loves us. Because it's all about grace. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank You so much for the uh, opportunity this morning to share from the precious Word of God, Lord. Satan didn't want us to preach this sermon this morning. He sends somebody to break into the church. He puts my son in the hospital. We don't have a pianist. A lot of people... Maybe you've been scared to come this morning. I don't know, Lord, but we're going to keep on moving on because your grace is sufficient. And Lord, I pray for that one here this morning, or maybe many here this morning, or watching online that has struggled with guilt for many, many years. Maybe from something that happened a long, long time ago. It might not have not even been their fault. Maybe it was their fault, Lord, but you forgave them many years ago, but they still allow Satan to beat them up every day because of something that you've already forgotten about. You said you'll forgive us and forget about it. You'll separate our sin from us as far as the east is from the west. And Lord, it's all because of what Jesus did for us upon the cross. There's nothing that we can do to add to it. We don't have to live perfect lives and, and, and do this and that and jump through hoops to add. We can't add anything to what Jesus has already done. It's finished, it's paid in full. Lord, I just pray that you'll help us to all understand this as we continue to move through this series, Lord. In a couple weeks, healing grace. Some people need to be healed of this, this false guilt that they have. Lord, we, again, we just thank you for Jesus and all that he did. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand and turn to page 307 as we sing our invitational hymn on Just As I Am. Just as I am without
Uh, we, we don't have a choral benediction. I'm going to ask somebody to pray, somebody to volunteer to pray. Um, I, I felt to think about this until a minute ago. I knew my sermon was a little bit long. I hope you'll share this. I may, I put last Sunday's on Facebook. I may do this whole series. So share it with your friends. Um, there's a lot of people out there that need to hear this truth. But um, last night at the hospital with Levi, he, we were talking about not having a pianist. And, and I said, we could just sing a couple of songs. We don't have to do them all. And he said, y'all could just pray. So just pray, pray for me. Oh. <laughs> so we've got a lot of people on a prayer list. But I'm going to ask somebody to volunteer to close us in prayer this morning and, and make sure you pray for Levi. Does anybody want to? I will. Okay. Thank you, Bill. You're welcome. Most gracious, loving, heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this time we come together and just uh, revive ourselves, Lord, with your spirit. And we thank you for the message we heard from Wendell today. The Lord has spoke to us personally. And we just want to lift up our congregation of sick people, Lord, the ones you love that are sick, especially Levi, Lord, just give the doctor's wisdom this morning in helping Levi, Lord, just helping determine what's wrong with him, Father, just you're on the great physician, Lord Jesus, and we just lift Levi to you this morning, Lord, ask you to heal him and Bless him and be with Patty while she's with him this morning. 